Luke chapter 8 and verse 15. <clears throat> As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. So we have been talking, if you have been with us, we have been talking over the past several weeks of success in God, success as God desires it, success as God defines it, and God wants all of his children to succeed. There's no earthly father who wants his children to be failures, and God loves his family more than any man would love his children, amen? But success in God, my friend, success in God is not measured it is not measured by how much knowledge you have, but by the results that knowledge has produced in your life. So success, as God sees it, is not measured in seed, but in fruit. Right? So many Christians say, oh, I know the word, I know the word. That's wonderful, and that's a prerequisite, but the Bible is not an end in itself. The Bible is a means to an end. The Bible is intended to produce results in your life, and that's what God's looking for. Can I get an amen? Now, this verse comes from what we call the parable of the sower, and this parable, this shows us that not everyone, not everyone who hears the word of God is changed in a positive way. If you read this whole chapter or this whole passage, you'll see that. In fact, in this story, only one out of four ultimately became fruitful. See, only one out of four persons ultimately became fruitful. And the problem was never because of defective seed, right? But rather infertile soil, huh? So that means if we are not seeing results from the word, it's not because God has failed us. It's because there are heart issues that need to be corrected. If the word is not producing fruit in your life, then there's something wrong with the soil. There's no problem with the seed. I know it's easy to blame the sower, but it's not my fault. And it's easy to blame the Bible, but it's not God's fault. So who's left? Well, when you go home, look in the mirror and write me a letter. Okay, it's our hearts that need to receive the word. Now. Luke chapter 8, verse 12 says, some hearts are hard. How many of you have a hard heart? Don't raise your hand. Some hearts are hard, like those that are sown on the wayside or literally on the road. Well, most of our roads are hard. Maybe not in Nogland, but most of our roads are hard. And it says there, at that place, the devil comes and takes away the word. Then again, some hearts are superficial, not super, but superficial, like the shallow soil in verse 13 in this same passage. These are the people that get excited in church. They jump, they shout, they dance. But later, he says, in a time of testing, when persecution or pressure comes from family, community, friends, they fall away. Some hearts, he said, Jesus said, are distracted, like soil overgrown with weeds, in verse 14. Worries and worldly desires crowd out, push out the word of God, and squeeze the life out of it, choke it. But it's a good heart that produces good fruit. And a good heart is not some rare gift that God gives just to a few chosen select people. You know, there's just one lucky person here tonight that God has foreordained that you're going to have a, 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 a fruitful life. You're going to have a receptive heart and everybody else, well, you're just, you know, you're just marble and concrete and asphalt. No, 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 no. 
No, no, that's not true. You see, a good heart belongs to those who soften their heart, open their heart. Can you open your heart? Well, can you open your ears? Can you open your mind? Can you open? You know you can open your mouth, right? They open their heart and they resist the devil refusing to listen to his lies. Do you know that while I'm preaching, the devil's talking to you right now as well? telling you why is he going on and on about this. I thought we would change the subject by now, and I'm really kind of tired. Don't you think it's a little cold in here? See, the devil's talking to you right now. you got to resist the devil if you want to be fruitful. I know the devil talks to Christians in church, especially when Pastor Jeppy says it's time for tithes and offerings. I know he starts talking to you and saying, oh, no, here we go again. Amen. This heart is found in those who sincerely want more than just a good time on Sunday. They are determined to become all that Jesus wants them to be. And nobody and nothing will dissuade them or deter them. It is seen in those who focus on the things that matter most, seeking his kingdom first. Oh, well, Brother John, I'm a very busy person. But you will always have time for the kingdom if you seek it first. You may not have time for something else, but you'll always have time if you seek it first. It's those who seek the kingdom first to whom God adds all these other things. Amen. You should say amen. You're here on a Wednesday afternoon. You should say amen. That's me. That's me, Pastor John. Hallelujah. Amen. And they lay aside every weight, anything that slows them down. And those who see results, Jesus said, are those who hear. So you got to hear, right? And hold fast to the word in an honest and good heart. Some translations say this, a receptive heart or an obedient heart. One translation says a noble heart. And then one translation says a generous heart. Hmm. Now, but notice this verse, Luke 8, 15. Notice it says, they bear fruit. Put that verse back up again, Luke 8, 15. Notice this, they bear fruit with patience. They bear fruit with patience. No one can succeed in God without this most crucial element patience. That's what the Lord's given me to tell you. If you want to be successful, if you want to fulfill God's plan for your life, if you want to be a fruitful Christian, if you want to prosper, you must have patience. Everybody sit down. I'm still preaching. Now that tells me something. That tells me that not everything that God does in our lives is instant. That means many things require the W word, waiting. That's not a dirty word. Waiting. Many things require waiting. If you are unwilling to wait, you probably will be unable to receive God's best. God's best for your life requires patience. That's why some people don't get the best blessing. They get the secondhand blessing. They get the, the, the third class blessing because they're impatient. Now, friends, Jesus did not compare God's kingdom to a bullet fired from a gun. Pull the trigger, boom, instantly it's gone. Or a meal warmed up in a microwave oven Bing, 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 click, dot, 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 bing, it's all ready. But in Matthew chapter 13, verse 31, he said this, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. Now, see, that's not really exciting, is it? I mean, that's kind of like, huh, you know, 
you're, you're, you're thinking something, you know, cosmically exciting and just amazing and dramatic and spectacular. It's like somebody sowing seed. So this suggests that the work of God, the work that God does in our lives, often begins small and takes time. That, that's, that's, that's worth the trip here, just to know that. Often the work that God wants to do in your life begins small, because seeds are small, you see, and it takes time. Huh? Its origins are usually unimpressive, and the change is incremental but it grows and it grows, expands until eventually it eclipses everything else in your world. That's how God works. That's how God works, see? Now, we're talking about patience. In Galatians chapter six, verse nine, it says this, you know, in due season, we shall reap, we will reap if we do not give up. When is due season? I'm, I'm ready for the due season. How about you? When is the due season? When is that going to come? Well, it almost always comes later than you want. It almost always takes longer than your flesh wants to wait. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. So it requires patience, patience. What happens if we do give up? Then we won't be there when the harvest comes in. Many Christians have sown good seed, and good seed has been sown into their life, but because they don't have the patience, they're not there for payday. They're not there for the promotion time. They're not there when God opens the door. They're not there when he pours out his glory. They're not there when the anointing and the gifts are being distributed because they were too impatient. Come on, can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. So if we are impatient people, we will never achieve the measure of success that God desires for us. Amen? Amen. Now, when I say the word patience, nobody in this place gets excited. I noticed nobody jumped up and shouted glory. I Nobody took a lap around the sanctuary when I said I'm going to teach on patience. No, most of you are looking like a photograph right now. You, 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 I'm not even sure if you're still breathing. Huh? Huh? Because people don't get excited about patience. How many books are on your bookshelf entitled Patience? None. But the measure of your patience largely determines the measure of your success. Oh, you ought to write that down, friend. I'm preaching better than you're listening. The measure of your patience largely determines, mostly determines, has a lot to do with the measure of your success. Amen? Now, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12 says this. It encourages us to imitate and follow the example of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now see, many of us have heard countless sermons on faith. Huh? But we rarely, if ever, hear any teaching or preaching on patience. But if you don't have any patience, it doesn't matter how much faith you have. It would be better for you, and I say this frequently, it would be better for you to have a little bit of faith and a whole lot of patience than to have all the faith in the world and no patience. Some people have mountain-moving faith for 30 seconds. That don't, that's not going to work. You have to have the patience 
just to stay in the game, to keep on going. Amen. That's Hebrews 6. If we go down to verse 15, it says that Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promises or obtained the promise. Having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. Now, see, the Bible tells us that we're supposed to have the faith of Abraham. Huh? That he that has faith like Abraham will be blessed like Abraham. But see, if you have Abraham's faith, you're going to have to have Abraham's patience. Are you out there? Abraham was 75 years old when God promised to make of him a great nation and bless all the peoples of the earth. He was 100 years old when Isaac was born. He was 75 when God gave him the calling and the promise, gave him the vision. He was 100 when the first and only son of promise was born. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13 that he died in faith not having received the things that were promised. He died in faith, not having received all the things that God had promised, but he saw them at a distance. He embraced them. He welcomed them. You see, Abraham wanted a son. God wanted much more than that. God wanted his son to rescue and redeem humanity. Sometimes the reason things take longer than we expect is because God is thinking bigger than us. We just want to be healed. God wants to give us a healing ministry. We just want to have our bills paid. God wants to make us a conduit, a blessing that he can use to finance the gospel. Huh? We just want the immediate need to be taken care of. God wants to turn our mess into a message, our test into a testimony. God has a better plan. We're thinking about just now, right now. God's got looking at the long term. He's thinking about future generations. That's why sometimes it takes longer than what we anticipate. Are you here today? Now, we know that Romans chapter 10, verse 17, says that faith comes by hearing the word of God. So, and if you want to increase in faith, you need to keep on hearing the word of God. But how do we get patience? Well, notice Romans, but this time chapter 5 and verse 3. Romans 5, 3, not only that, but we rejoice. Somebody say rejoice. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. The word for endurance in this verse is the same Greek word translated patience in other places. So this verse says suffering produces patience. Now, if I thought it was quiet before, now it is deathly still. But that's what the Bible says. Now, the word for suffering in this verse is the Greek word flipsis. Flipsis. It's hard to say that without spitting on yourself. Flipsis. And it literally means pressure. Pressure. See? It would be external pressure that is causing internal pressure conflict, pressure, squeeze. Hmm? Now, you do not develop patience simply by experiencing hard times, but by rejoicing in them. Let me say that again. You do not develop patience, not this God kind of patience, by simply having bad things happen to you. There's a lot of people in this world who have experienced all kinds of misfortune. They don't have any patience. They're worse off than they ever were. It comes by rejoicing in your suffering. 
not rejoicing necessarily because of your suffering, but in the middle of it, you can still rejoice. Why? Because you know something. Hallelujah, you're developing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, it's not straining, gritting your teeth, holding on by your fingernails just to struggle across to the end. It's having a cheerful expectation and a positive attitude while you wait. It's not just waiting, it's what you do while you're waiting. That's why some people are waiting a long time because they're not doing the right thing. Amen? Now, <clears throat> you may not appreciate this, but you know, I'm, I'm here to help you. I'm here to give you the truth. One reason, one reason why things seem to move slowly in our lives like answers to prayer and, you know, your breakthrough, your promotion, you know, your miracle, that type of thing. One reason why things sometimes, maybe not always, but sometimes seem to move slowly is this. God is more concerned about you developing stamina and endurance than you just finding some immediate relief from the pressure. God is more concerned about the development of your character than your immediate comfort. I say immediate means like just for that particular moment. He, he would rather you to go through some things so you can develop endurance and steadfastness and patience, even if it's a little unpleasant, because he knows it's worth it. Are you out there today? Hallelujah. In fact... It is actually better for you if your prayers are not instantly answered. Oh, it's real quiet now. I, I know you didn't hear. Am I speaking English to people that understand English? It's actually better for you. I repeat, it's better for you that your prayers are not instantly answered. Why? Because many times when we have to wait, when we have to endure, we're developing that patience, and that's what's needed to get the bigger things, to move into the bigger places in life. We live in an impatient world. And this generation is less patient than the generation before. Our grandparents had like miracle patience compared to us. They'd walk up the side of a mountain to pick an orange. We, we, we can't walk across the street to go to church. You know, we, we, we need to develop patience. Maybe I'm preaching too quickly. Maybe we should start having three-hour sermons so you could really develop patience. We might try that tonight, but I'm not sure. All right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Flipsis. Again, that Greek word means pressure. You know, from pressure, a, 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 a fragment of carbon is transformed into a diamond. So that means you do need a little pressure in your life. You do need a little pressure. I don't mean to say you're having an anxiety attack and you're, you're having a nervous breakdown, but you need a little pressure, especially people that we know and love in this locality. They need a little pressure because they're just complacent. Sometimes God wants to pour the oil, you know, and heal, and sometimes God wants to kick us in the rear end, right in the blessed assurance, because you need a little pressure to get you moving. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So God will allow, I'm not necessarily saying he's doing this, but he will allow difficulties. Hmm? Or even persecution. Now, I'm not talking about sickness and disease. We're redeemed from that. I'm not talking about guilt and shame from sin because that's what the blood of Jesus is for. But we're not redeemed from persecution. There is a suffering for the cause of Christ. We're not necessarily redeemed from difficulties. There are, going to be, there are going to be challenges in this world. You don't need me to tell you that. You know that already. But God will allow these things many times so that you will develop patience. Now notice Romans chapter 5. We read verse 3. Let's read verse 4. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. You know why some people don't have any hope? They don't have any patience. They don't have any patience. 
Now, the Greek word for character in this verse actually means to be proven, to be tested, or, or really to be proven. Every victory, every answer to prayer, every time you're able by God's help to overcome a challenge, every breakthrough in your life, every victory is a mile post on the journey marking your progress in God. With each triumph, you gain experience. You become more seasoned. It's no longer a theory. It's your life story. Now you are qualified to instruct others, to share with others. Now your message has credibility because you've been through it. And you emerge from the conflict proven, having passed the test, and stronger. Now, the enemy may have brought it to destroy you, but you're going to come through the fire unburned, and you're going to be stronger than you were. I'm sure Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would say amen to that. Amen. You, you may have to come through the flood waters, but you'll come through them stronger, more assured, more confident of God's ability to sustain you. I'm sure Noah would say amen to that. You're going to have to go through some stuff. But God's going to be with you, and he's going to see you to the other side. And you will be prepared for the next bigger challenge. When David was talking to King Saul, he said, I first fought the lion, and I fought the bear, and this giant shall be like one of them. So this was not the first challenge David ever faced. Some people want to be giant killers, but they first need to, you know, kill some other little smaller giants in their life first fight the lion and the bear. Hallelujah. Amen. Notice this verse, James chapter 1 and verse 4. James 1, 4. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Again, the same word for steadfastness is translated patience, patience. Now, the expression, let steadfastness or patience have its full effect, that's just another way of saying, don't go halfway and then quit. See this thing through till the end. Keep on going, even if there's some setbacks along the way. That's what that means. See, patience, it involves waiting, that's true, but patience often is more than waiting. It is being steady. It is being consistent. Even when it looks like there is no change, there is no improvement, maybe there's no hope. Being consistent, being steady, even in the face of adversity. Patience doesn't mean you do nothing. Well, I've been patient, Brother John. I've been very patient. I've been sitting on this chair for many, many years, just waiting for some blessing to follow me. That's not patience. It's not just waiting. Patience means you keep on doing what you know you should do. You keep on believing. You keep on praying. You keep on praising God. You keep on feeding on the word of God. You keep on holding fast to your confession of faith. You keep on walking in love. You keep on forgiving others. You keep on giving. You keep on serving. You just keep on keeping on. That's what patience means. You don't quit. You just see the thing through. Can I get an amen? amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, when you say things like, I'm fed up. I've had it up to here. I can't take it anymore. I just quit. Then you're saying all of your prayers were a waste of time. Huh? You're saying that all of your confessions was just nonsense. That's what you're saying. You're taking everything you've done in God and you're discarding it in the dustbin. 
You're walking by sight and not by faith. Put the facts of God's word ahead of your feelings. God's word is true no matter how you feel right now. God is still on the throne no matter what you're going through right now. This changes nothing. His word is just as valid today as it was 100 years ago or as it will be 100 years from now. This changes nothing. So God said, I do not change. So make sure you don't change. And if you will not allow the circumstances or your feelings to change your faith, your faith will change the circumstances. But you got to be steady. You got to be consistent. Now, the devil is putting pressure on you because your prayers, your faith, your confession, your obedience is putting pressure on him. Huh? Why would the enemy tell you your prayers aren't working? Has the devil ever whispered that to your mind? This little thought just seems to come. Your prayers aren't working. Your prayers aren't working. Look, you've been praying and praying and praying and nothing has happened. Can't you see that? Why would the enemy tell you all of your faith confession is a waste of time? If it was a waste of time, he wouldn't tell you that. He'd encourage you to keep on doing it. Huh? Why is he trying to get you to quit? because it is working. (laughs) It's obvious. It is working. He's feeling the heat. He's sensing the pressure, and he knows if he can get you to stop, if he can get you to quit, then he'll, he'll get the victory. That's why he's stirring up contention. That's why he's bringing pressure. That's why he's trying to get you angry and frustrated, because you're right there. He knows due season is right here. It's just right here, and if I can get them to stop, if I can get them to quit, they'll not get the harvest. But you need to stay steady. I said, you need to stay steady. Hallelujah. And here's the benefit of patience. James 1, 4, again, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Oh, boy. That's shouting ground right there. That's something to get happy about. Let me read that again. Let patience have its perfect work. Don't quit that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Notice it says that you, before God can change your circumstance, he must change you. See, many people are praying, God, change my spouse. God, change my children. God, change my boss. God, change uh, change, uh, my colleagues. God, change my family. God, change my community. God, change my world. Well, there's one other person that you didn't mention. God changed me. God changed me. Before God can change your situation, he must change you. That you may be perfect. Patience will perfect you. That means without patience, there's something about your life that's imperfect and incomplete. I don't care if you've been in church since you were just, you know, a gleam in your father's eye or whatever, since you've been knee-high to a grasshopper. I don't care if you've been to Bible school and you've got, you know, MDiv and and BTH and pothole digger degree, and I don't care what, what, if you will not be patient, there's something missing from your spiritual life. And, And what affects you spiritually affects every area of your life. Are you listening to me? And notice this. He says that with patience, you'll be lacking nothing. One translation says this, you will have everything that you need. Ooh, that's pretty big, isn't it? You will have everything that you need. Everybody say everything. Say it like this, everything. (laughs) Everything that you need. Hallelujah. That sounds good to me. What? If you will just believe God, obey God, serve God, walk with God, and be consistent. Let patience have her perfect work. Woo! So there is no prosperity in God without patience. So that means God's prosperity is not a get-rich-quick scheme. What does Psalm 1 say? says that he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth 
his fruit in season. His leaf will not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Prosperity is not a gift. It's a process. Trees grow. They grow. It takes time. That's where the patience comes in. Jesus said, Mark eleven twenty four. believe that you have received them, or it, and it will be yours. What happens between the believing you have received it and it shall be yours? Patience. So he didn't say when it will be yours. He just said it will be yours. So in the meantime, patience, patience. Hallelujah. Let me go a little bit further. I'm almost done. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says this. The Lord is not slow. Aren't you glad God is not slow? I know some of you are, but God is not slow. He's not slow to fulfill his promise. Now, see, some people imagine God has arthritis or something like that, that, that when you pray, the angels have to wake him up. No, no, God is not slow. He said, I'm alert and active watching over my word. God doesn't need to drink Red Bull. God's wide awake. I don't know about you, but God's wide awake. He don't need a cup of coffee. God is wide awake today. Amen? He's not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. But notice this. But he's not slow. He's not slow. But he's patient toward you. Now we, and of course I don't really mean you, I mean those people that should be seated in the balcony but are not here today. <laughs> we are often impatient with God. Right? We, we call it prayer, but it's actually complaining. God, I've been waiting for several years now. It's not happening. God, come on, God. I've been waiting a long time. It's been over two hours. We are often impatient with God, yet he is so very patient with us. In other words, we can't wait maybe more than a minute or two. Some people, after 40 minutes or so, I'm, I mean, their body's there. You know, the carcass is there on the church chair, but the spirit and soul have gone home. I know that. We need the ushers to take the body home. They, 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 you, know, they, they, you know, after a couple of minutes, that's it. They're gone, right? We can't, we, we, we can't wait more than a minute or two. But God may be waiting on us for years. When we want God to do something, we want it now. K-N-O-W, right now, right now, right now. When God wants us to do something, heaven can wait. I'll get to that. Yeah, God, I'm, I'm going to do that. First of, let's just make it the first of next year. No, no, no. We, we don't mind making God wait, but we don't want to wait on him. But shouldn't the lesser wait on the greater? You, you understand, it would be the epitome of arrogance for you to insist that God conform to your schedule. God doesn't wear a watch. He's the ancient of days. <laughs> he, he, he did it when he wants to do it. It's for us to just say, Lord, not only whatever you want to do, but whenever you'd like to do it, that'll be just fine with me. Maybe you're making a mistake. You're trying to push God. Come on, let, 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 by tomorrow, by, by this week, for sure, by the end of this year. Maybe that's a mistake. If God is delaying, it's not because he's slow. It's because it'd actually be better for you not to have that right now. Amen. In other words, you just need to trust God. He loves you so much that he'll take care of you and he's not going to cheat you. It's real quiet in here. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Notice verse 8. This is, again, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It's actually the previous verse, you know. Do not, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. So we know God lives in the realm of timeless eternity. So time means nothing to him. Timing means everything, but time means nothing to him, see? So 
what seems like a long time for you, like this message, what seems like a long time for you, for God is nothing. See, I mean, most of you, or many of you, like you're in your 20s and 30s, some of you are in your 40s, some of you, we don't know how old you are, but you know, but, but when you're young, like me, when you're young, you know, you know, you don't have a lot of patience, it seems everything's real slow, but you know, the Bible says, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Like, you know, think about a vapor. Like, ladies, like maybe you, you put on your hairspray. I don't know, do you, do you have any hairspray? I know some of you guys don't use hairspray. Some of you don't have hair. But, you know, like, uh, you know, psh, just it sprays out. Psh, just like, boom, and it's gone. It's gone, right? So it's, it's very brief. It seems like a long life. He lived to be, oh, he lived to be 90, a long time. But in God's eyes, that's just a little vapor, just a vapor. See, God doesn't have the same perspective that you have. Because you're down here living in time. He's living in eternity. God may give you a vision for your future. He may reveal to you a a part of the plan or a picture of what he has for you. And you think, oh, glory, it's going to happen by next Thursday. (laughs) But, But some things that God will show you may take years before they come to pass. In fact, sometimes you think God must have made a mistake or something like that, or he got his wires crossed, or I guess maybe I just imagined I saw that. But no, no, it's just God's very patient. God is very patient. If you don't know that, you don't know God. He is very, very patient. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When I was in the second standard, I think it was class two, maybe class three, but I think it was class two. I remember this so clearly. Uh, the teacher asked all of us f- as a writing assignment to write down what you'll do in the future. And I, I don't know why, but I wrote, I'm going to travel to different countries and write books. And, uh, you know, uh, when I was a boy, my mother bought for me like a little print, little miniature printing set. And I was so fascinated by that, printing little things and making little things. And later on when I was in, uh, like uh, older in school, I got a, t- a nice typewriter, electric typewriter, a really nice typewriter. And I learned somewhat how to type. And I began typing like pages to make like little books. Later on, I got a jo- and I was, I was older now, I got a job working as a printer in, in, a, in, a, in a big in a company, learning how to print. And then, then I, when I was married, I, we bought a, a word processor. This is about the same time that personal computers were just coming onto the market, and, and this is all we could afford. And I even brought it with me, you know, when we first came to Nagland, I began to type like little manuscripts and things like that and, and, and to save those things. Sometimes I was typing a whole manuscript, and then the light, you know, shut off and everything was lost. I had to redo it again, etc. Some of the things, the seeds that God planted in my heart only in these days, in this time, have come to pass. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. I was attending a conference many years ago. And everybody was praising the Lord, worshiping God, wonderful time. And suddenly, I heard the Lord speak to me. It was not just a witness or a sense. I heard a voice say to me in my heart, I have taught you the word of my patience. And to be honest, when I heard that, I didn't know what that meant. And I I thought maybe I've read that somewhere in the Bible, but I'm not sure. And I, I didn't know. And that's all I heard. I've taught you the word of my patience. It actually comes from Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 where Jesus said, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world. But now these many, many years later, you know, some 30, 35 years later, I suppose, I know that God was telling me, I have been helping you, and I need a lot more help. My wife can testify. But I have been, he's been saying, I was helping you to develop patience. Because he knew that's what I needed. Now, 
I am, in case you didn't know this, I'm from America. And Americans are impatient people. And I was very impatient person. You know, and I say this all the time humorously, but, you know, sometimes I even pray, God, give me patience and give it to me right now. I don't want to wait for nobody. Even now, my wife gets frustrated with me. I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. I hate waiting in the queue, and I get frustrated like that. Do mm. you know that maybe you, oh, boy, I never thought about this. Maybe you have to wait in the long queue. How come when I go to pay the telephone bill, the electric bill, there's always long queue? Because he's teaching you the word of his patience. <laughs> maybe. Huh? Huh? In uh, 1994, as you know, the Lord spoke to me. I just came here. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything. The Lord spoke to me. I want you to start a church. And when I made the commitment, when I, when I consecrated myself to do it, then he gave me the desire to do it. I didn't have the desire until I said yes. See? And then I saw myself. I don't really mean like a vision, you know, like seeing an angel or something. But in my heart, I saw myself preaching and teaching, you know, like a, like a large crowds and things like that. But that was 26 years ago. The thing I saw then in here, I've only seen with my eyes in more recent times. Now, the, here's the funny thing about it. God didn't tell me it would take 26 years. He left that part out. <laughs> if he, well, first service we had, I think, uh, I think we had like eight people the first Sunday service, Spirit of Faith Church, we had eight people. Glory. People were staying away in droves. We had eight people. See, I didn't know it would take this long. See, nobody had coronavirus back in 1994. But I, would, I didn't know it would take this long. If, he, if I knew, I probably would have quit. I probably would have never even tried. So that's why he left that out. Hallelujah. It takes patience. Takes patience. I know that even this sermon is developing patience in you right now. You're enduring suffering. Somebody asked John Osteen, the father of Joel Osteen, Lakewood Church. Someone asked John Osteen the secret of his success. And he said this, I simply outlasted everyone else. That's endurance. I wouldn't quit. I just kept on going. When you feel like quitting, that's probably the time when you need to endure. There are seasons in life. There are times when God will close a door and open another one. But you'll go out with joy and be led forth with peace. I'm not going to quit because the devil's pressuring me. I'm not going to quit because I'm angry and frustrated in the flesh. Although we are all tempted like that. Amen. But when you feel like quitting... That's when patience needs to do its perfect work in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The devil is impatient. See, he doesn't have the nature of God. God is patient. The devil doesn't have God's nature. The devil's very impatient. Demons are very impatient. The devilish people are very impatient. If you'll just be consistent, you don't even have to know every verse in the Bible or anything like that. If you'll just be consistent and patient, eventually the devil will get fed up and he'll quit. And you'll just keep on going. Just keep on going. Things will come your way, challenges, people talk bad about you, adversity, don't feel appreciated, feel slighted, feel insulted, everything. But you just keep on going. You just, the devil will throw at you every dart, every flaming arrow he's got, every weapon. Just keep on going. Just keep on going. And eventually he'll just wear himself out. Oh, my friend, do any of you guys like boxing? I'm not a boxer, obviously. I mean, but some people really love boxing, prize fighting. And one of the most famous fights was between, I think, Muhammad Ali. And I think it was, a, I think it was a, 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 perhaps it was Joe Frazier. I'm not sure. But, you know, Muhammad Ali, he, he didn't even fight. He just kind of held his arms up. And the enemy, the other guy was just pounding away and pounding and pounding. You know, uh, uh, round after round after round after round. They're like in the 12th round, 13th round. And they're thinking, Muhammad Ali is getting pounded. He's just getting pulverized. You know, he, he, might, he might get seriously hurt. And he just took it and just took it and took it. And the other guy just wore himself out. 
he just couldn't punch anymore. He, just, he, he was just punching so hard and giving everything he had. He just didn't have any more strength. And he finally, his arms just fell aside. Muhammad Ali took one punch. Boom! And that guy went flying across the ring. And the fight was over. That sometimes that's how it is. Let the devil throw everything he's got. I'm protected with the armor of God, which is able. I hold up the shield of faith, which is able to quench every fiery dart. And he just throw everything at God. And then he'll say, I'm out of weapons. And you'll say, and I'm still standing.